So, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, today might be a little bit of a short day. We'll see. Um, the reason why is because the example that we're going to do with the beam, we're going to sort of do it twice because um, there's a couple points I want to make with it. And the, the first, I guess, component of it might actually not take very long, especially after the truss example that we did because a lot of the modeling is very similar. However, there are a, a couple things that I want to, to do with the beam, and, and it's really more to get you all thinking about things like coordinate systems and, and orientation. Make sure you've got your X, Y, and Z and your right hand rule and all that stuff you haven't thought about for four years. You know, make sure that you've got that stuff in your head. Because again, what, what I want you to be able to do is, you know, when you leave here, Granted, you know, if you get a job and you're using Abacus or Ansys or something that I didn't show you, it's very possible. But I at least want you to understand some of those core principles, some of the, you know, making sure that you have everything referenced to the same coordinate system, that you know your units and all, all of that stuff. Those little things can actually drive you nuts. I want to go through some of this. Now, one of the things that we didn't discuss with the trust, because it really didn't matter, was member orientation. In other words, if I have a truss, let's say, you know, here's a support and here's a support and I've got some truss structure, right? The truss has a bunch of little members in it, right? Now, if I look at a given member in that truss, it doesn't really matter if it's oriented this way or this way or that way because all I'm doing is I'm taking that member and I'm yanking on it. It doesn't matter what the orientation is of an individual element. However, if we're looking at a beam, then that very much does matter. Because if you're looking at something like an I section or you know, a rectangular section, if I take that beam and bend it like this versus bending it like that, this would behave quite differently. So the orientation of that beam is actually going to matter quite a bit. So we're going to start to delve a little more deeply into some of those three-dimensional issues and details today. And also, we're going to have a little bit of a civil engineering flair to it because I'm a steel guy and I can't help it. I'm, we're doing some steel stuff today. So um, we're going to do this example here on the right. Now, um, like I said, we're going to do it twice because when we do it our first time, our answers are not that they're not they're going to be wrong. They're just maybe we can take some of our answers later on and improve upon it. Now. One of the things that I did with this example is I wanted to make sure I was including some, some 3D stuff in a two-dimensional uh, setting. Things like you know, making sure you know your right-hand rule, making sure you know your beam orientation, and stuff like that. Now, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit with this example as well. For instance, we've got a beam. It's fixed on the ends, and we've got roller supports here, here, and here, which I'm just going to use pen supports. That really doesn't matter or isn't going to matter too much with, with the type of analysis that we're going to perform. But one of the things that you all should know by now is a very important parameter is this, the moment of inertia, which is, uh, they say here, is 310 inches to the fourth. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use something really close, but um, I'm going to use something a little different for a very specific reason. Okay, everybody okay with the problem? Just kind of understanding what's going on with it. Okay, we're going to model this beam also a little bit differently. Okay, what we did before with the truss and with the uh, uh, with the truss and with the, the the beam that we did is <coughs> we created a geometry. Like remember that cantilever beam we did? We created a geometry and then we assigned elements to that geometry. I'm going to skip that, and I'm actually just going to create the nodes and elements directly, okay? We're going to skip all that geometry stuff. So technically, it's going to be, I guess, less steps or less modules that we have to go through. And the reason why is I just want to cut out some of the middle work and show you that there are other ways to approach these types of problems. Now, if you've got something really complicated, I wouldn't do that, but it's just, you know, food for thought. Okay, everybody good? Now, before we open FE Map, I want to do a couple things with the units and show you a couple, uh, 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 I guess, um, how can I put it? Uh, a couple techniques that I'm going to use to run this model. All right, um, let me open up my little handy dandy notebook thing. 
right here. Well, you ever think you get a Blue's Clues reference in grad school? I mean, goodness. All right, there's a sign-in sheet going around somewhere. Okay. Um, so you all have the uh, the image of the beam in front of you, right? That was on the last set of slides. The beam. Okay. All right. So a couple things that I'm going to do. Um, let's see. So here's the beam. Let me copy that image. Over here. Oh. Copy that image. Maybe. Okay, that's not what I wanted. There we go. I'm going to put that in the notebook. Woo, that's big. Take that and make that a little smaller. There we go. So now that way I'm actually kind of looking at the, uh, at the beam while I'm working. Okay. Now, in order to um, make this analysis simpler, okay, let, let's go back to what you all did before. How many joints are there in this, this model? How many joints or nodes would we have in this model? Five, right? We'd have one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. Okay? So that'd be five joints, right? Or five nodes. Um, I'm going to use a couple more. I'm actually going to place a node right here, and I'm going to place a node right here. Okay? And the reason why is it's just going to make our lives easier in the world of FE map to actually place a node there. Um, now let's take, for instance, this distributed load here. There's two kips per foot here on the very left. Can we apply those loads without placing additional nodes and elements? Well, yeah, we can. But when you're using a, a high-powered software program like FE map, well, there's really no need to. I mean, uh, keep, you know, keep in mind, this thing can handle you know, 2,000 by 2,000 you know, really, you know, like that. So um, I'm going to just throw a couple other nodes in there because it's going to make my life easier down the line. Now, like I said, we're going to do this problem twice. When we do it twice, we're going to have a lot of nodes and elements. Like we're going to use an element like every foot. So there's going to be quite a few of them in there. Okay, So <laughs> that's just food for thought. Um, but I'm going to play seven nodes. So um, let me draw a couple things out. So here's my coordinate system. That's Y, and that's X. So if I want, maybe I'll just draw the beam down below just to sort of illustrate what I'm doing. Here's my beam. Here's my beam, and then I've got, what, a support here, a support here, a support here, and then a fixed on each end, right? Okay, so help me out. This point right here, this is x equals zero, right? Right there at the support, okay? At this first roller, what is that? That's x equals 24, but it's 24 feet, right? If I want to do this in inches, I need to multiply that by 12, and that'd be x equals 288. Y'all see what I'm doing here? But then this one's x equals 576. This one's x equals 864. And this one's x equals 11.52. Y'all see how I'm doing that? I'm just adding those dimensions up and multiplying by 12. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a node right here and one right here. And I'm placing them there because that's where this distributed load ends and it's where I've got concentrated forces and moments. All right. So that first one is at x equals 16 feet or 192, right? So this is 192. And this one is at x equals, what is that, 24 plus 12, 36. 36 times 12 ends up being 432. All right, does that make sense? Sound good? Okay, all right. Now. A couple things uh, before we begin is I want to talk a little bit about that beam orientation. Now, I started off, like I said, I'm going to cheat a little bit, okay? I'm not going to use I equals 310 inches to the fourth. And I'm not going to do that because I want to explore some of the features in FEMAP regarding visualization 
So I'm going to use something that's kind of close, okay? Anybody in here? I know, I know my, my civil folks are going to be able to testify to this, especially the ones that are taking this class. But um, mechanical folks, do you, do you all ever, have you all ever had any experience with steel design, like structural steel design at all? Yeah. A little bit? Okay, all right, so a little bit. Okay, I'm going to, instead of using I equals 310 inches to the fourth, I'm going to instead use a W12 by 40, okay? So a W12 by 40 is, for, the, for you mechanical majors, that is, like if you ever see a building going up, you ever see those I sections, those beams and columns, that, all right, in, a, in America, we, we, tend, we don't call them I beams anymore. It's just because of the way we manufacture them now. The W stands for the fact that they are wide flange shapes. The flanges are wide. Now, I'm using a W12 by 40, just a little um, food for thought. The 12 is about how deep it is. Um, it's not exactly 12, but it's close. It might be like 11.7 or 12.2 or whatever, but it's about 12. And the 40 stands for how much it weighs. So 40 would be 40 pounds per foot, okay? Now, I'm using a W12 by 30 because its moment of inertia is really close. It has a, a, an IX value of 307 inches to the fourth, okay? Now, I'm actually going to draw a couple things out, okay? Now, if you ever see anybody doing steel design, they tend to have these big, thick manuals look like this, and they have all the shape properties and design aids and tables and what have you. I'm going to list some of the properties of a W12 by 40 because we're going to use them later. Okay, so W12 by 40, it's an I-shaped beam, looks something about like this. You know, something about like that, okay? And then for some dimensions, okay, the actual depth of a W12 by 40 is 11.9 inches. And this is the type of stuff you can look up. You can just go look this stuff up. All right, uh, the web, which is that middle portion, its thickness is 0 0.295 inches. Its flange width, and it's the same on top as it is on the bottom, is 8.01 inches. And then the flange thickness, again, same on top as it is on the bottom, is 0 0.515 inches. So there's just tables and tables and tables of this stuff. Okay? Sound good? Now, where's the centroid of that beam? Somewhere about like that? Sound good? All right. So I'm going to draw a little bit over here on the side. Okay? So the centroid, oh, get my color back. The centroid of that beam is probably somewhere about somewhere about like that, right? Okay. Now, FE map defaults to a particular direction for beam orientation and we're going to use that. When you're looking at a beam a, a beam cross section like this here in the center and then this x and y axis represents the centroid, we tend to refer to this direction here, the one I'm sort of, you know, shading in really darkly. This shaded in vector right here, we have a very special name for it, and that is the beam orientation vector. Okay, and, and the reason for that is you know, when we did two-dimensional, you know, sheared moment diagrams and deflections and reactions and all that, it, it's really simple. You just say I equals whatever and move and go, you know. But in three dimensions, a, a finite element program like FE Map, it, it needs to know, well, which I value do I use for the stiffness values going like this and which I value do I use going like that? Because it's three-dimensional, FE Map doesn't know which one to use, okay? So what we're going to do is utilize this concept of beam orientation to make sure that the beam is facing the way we want it to face. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. 
So how are we going to do that? Okay, so this is a beam orientation vector. Okay, now forgive my artwork because I'm horrible at this. Well, and somewhat extend this down a little bit. Okay, so when you use FE map, you're drawing in three dimensions, right? So maybe what we've got is Maybe we've got as a coordinate system where this is the y-axis, the x-axis kind of goes something about like this, and the z-axis kind of goes something about like that, right? So if we draw our beam out like this, right? I mean, keep in mind we're just going to be drawing a bunch of lines, right? Our beam is probably going to go, you know, something like this, right? You know, we're going to have a bunch of nodes you know, whatever, kind of like that, right? And, you know, we're going to have, you know, let's say a, uh, let's say we're going to have, a, you know, a fixed support there, a fixed support there. And then our rollers, you know, like here or wherever, like here, they're going to be resisting displacement in the Y direction, right? That's going to be resisting displacement in the Y direction. So we all clear on the, the orientation? So, if I set my beam down, usually you set it down so like if, I, if I'm like here I'm in this building and I've got this floor system and I'm standing on it, usually the flanges are like this and like this and the webs kind of like that, right? So I'm probably, you know, if I'm following my coordinate system, my beam is probably going to look, I don't know, something like that. Make sense? So in that setting, my beam orientation vector needs to go that way, right? And in that direction, what would we have? We would have 0, 0, minus 1. See what I mean? So that beam orientation vector is going to go about like that. Does that make sense? So when I just start, oh, plug it in 0, 0, minus 1, you're going to see why I'm doing that. Okay. If I wanted to take that beam and then turn it 90 degrees, I might use 0, 1, 0. And then it would be bending in its weak direction. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions? All right. Good stuff. Okay. Let me get out of this. Does everybody, do you all need to write any of this down or are you good? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So I went ahead and opened FE map. I don't know if you've already done so or what have you. You might want to go ahead and do that. Okay. So we're like I said, we're actually going to skip the geometry creation this time. Instead of creating geometry uh, and then assigning a mesh to that geometry, we're just going to hard code the elements in uh, for this go around. But before we do that, I want to go in and create some of the material properties and all of that associated stuff uh, and what have you. So let's see. Let's go to model. Let's go to, let's create a material. Let's create my, my favorite material, which is steel. So we'll create steel. It has a um, Young's modulus of 29,000 and a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.3. Um, now, you actually really theoretically only need those two values to calculate all of the necessary terms for elastic analysis in three dimensions, okay? Um, technically, for a two-dimensional plane beam analysis, you shouldn't need Poisson's ratio. However, if you're using a program that automatically incorporates some more advanced topics, things like um, uh, a Timoshenko beam, where a Timoshenko beam takes into account shear deformation, well then you need actually a shear modulus. And to compute a shear modulus, you need Young's modulus and nu. So if you don't put it in, you know, the program might get a little upset, you know. So in some instances, if you're not sure, it might actually be best to plug in some data to get the model to run, but then maybe test and see how those parameters are actually affecting your results. Like, what might happen is if you have a member that's really, really slender, it might shut down because it didn't get a Poisson's ratio, but then you'll find that shear deformations, ah, they, they really don't matter, not in really, really, really slender sections. Okay? Um, so just, you know, food for thought for later. But again, you always want to 
test and see how much those impacts really or those uh, parameters do have on your results. Because if they matter, then maybe you need some really accurate data. You know. Okay. Again, FEMAP. Give me, give me, give me. I need more, more, more. You have to tell it to shut up. That nope. I'm done. I only need more material. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create a um, an element or a property. Okay. Um, now. Uh, before we do that, we have to tell FEMAP what type of element we're going to create. Now, this might seem a little counterintuitive, and it is, but we're actually going to use uh, a bar element. You might go, well, wait a minute, bars don't bend. Well, it's all about how FEMAP references the elements that you're looking at. Bars are in FEMAP referred to as just sort of general um, you know, one-dimensional elements that can, you know, be pulled, twisted, bended, you can kind of do whatever you want to them. Um, and this is another thing, if you're ever unsure, you know, let me, here, let me minimize this. If you're ever unsure, go to the uh, element reference manual, okay? So, you know, remember this was that, out, that reference manual that tells you how those elements behave and perform. So, in NX Nastran, which that's the engine that we're using, uh, a bar element is known as a C bar. It's a general purpose beam, which, you know, I, I'll admit I think the naming's a little confusing myself. But it's a general purpose beam that supports tension and compression, torsion, bending in two uh, perpendicular planes, and shear in two perpendicular planes. So you can kind of do anything to a bar. So if you take a truss element and you bend it, the program gets upset. But for this, you can kind of do anything you want to with it. So let's just keep it simple and let's just use a bar. All right. So. Just wanted to give you that heads up. So we're going to use a bar. But then now our dialog box changes because we're not looking at a, a, a plate element anymore. <coughs> now, okay, the material, what's the material? It's steel, right? What about our uh, title? Let's actually give it a title. What do you think we should call this, this element? Maybe it's a W12 by 40, right? So we'll do W12 by 40. Okay, now um, you could just plug in. Oh, it's a W12 by 40. The moment of inertia is 307, and you're done. I'm not going to do that. Okay, now if you look here, we can load some values, save some values. See where it says shape. Instead of trying to look up uh, values and properties or try and calculate them on the side. Maybe I'll actually just define what the cross-section looks like. So this is a nifty little tool in FE Map where you can actually define a given cross-section. So, and it's actually pretty versatile. We can create beams that are rectangular, circular, circular bars, circular tubes, rectangular bars, rectangular tubes. There we go. An I-beam or a wide flange. Bam. Okay. Now, look at this. So it's asking for a few dimensions. It's asking for the height for the width on the top and the bottom, so we, you know, we can have different widths. We can also have variable thickness across the board. So the height for a W12 by 40, it was 11.9. The width for t the top and bottom flange was 8.01. And then the uh, uh, thickness on the top and the bottom, that was 0.515. And honestly, I think they should put the web thickness, but they don't. But that's going to be 0 0.295, right? Now, maybe you're not sure if that's right. Click Draw Section. Then that gives you an image of what it looks like. That's about right. It's 12 inches, about 12 inches deep by about 8 inches wide. That looks about like what we're looking for. Make sense? All right, so we we got a shape that we think seems to make sense. We hit OK. All right, so what it did by just hitting OK, it computed all of the necessary section properties. Now, the moment of inertia it computed is a little less than that 307, but I'm not really too stressed out about that. For those of you who have experience with steel design, you know that rolled shapes are not as simple as just rectangle and rectangle. Because of the rolling process, there's a little bit of a fillet right there in between the flange and the web, and that causes a little bit of increased stiffness. This was just thought it was a bunch of rectangles that so didn't take that into account. 
right? So, um, and then it goes through, it computes, you know, uh, torsional constants, areas, perimeters, all of that. Sound good? Okay, so we hit OK, and now we've created that bar. Again, FE Maps is going to say, give me more, give me more. you got to tell it to shut up. Nope, I'm done. All right, sound good? All right, now last time, what we did is we said, well, no, we got to define the geometry and then mesh it. I'm not doing that this time. I'm actually just going to create the finite element mesh directly. So instead of going into model and creating uh, nodes, I'm going to go into mesh, or, or, uh, or sorry, no, instead of going into geometry and creating points, I got ahead of myself, instead of going into geometry and creating points and curves, I'm going to go into model and create nodes and elements. Okay, so let's start off with nodes. All right? So literally, it's just saying, you know, X, Y, and Z, and it's telling us to enter those values in. Now, if you recall, we said we were going to do seven of these. So what do we have? We have, uh, and I'll write them up here for you because I have a feeling you're not going to be able to read them on the screen while you're doing this. But we've got 0, 192, 288, uh, 432, 576, 864, and 1152. And these are all in the x direction. The y and the z are all zero because we're assuming the beam just sort of goes this way, all right? So you should have seven of them when it's all said and done. So zero, then you can press enter and do 192, then you can press enter and do 288, and then 432, um, 576, 864, and then 11.52. And then again, FE Maps will say, give me more, give me more. you got to tell it you're done. And then there you go. Hit Control A, and there you go. You should have something look about like that. Make sense? All right. Now let's actually go through and create some elements. So model, element, and it's asking us for a couple things. So, all right. Let's go to, all right, so we're defining a bar element. What property are we going to use? Or maybe that W12 by 40 that we created earlier. Okay, before we start drawing everything, you know, we can draw it from node 1 to node 2, but, and then node 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 45, 46, you know, and so on. Maybe we need to define a vector, an orientation vector. And it's asking for the base and the tip, you know, from you know, beginning to end. So we could say zero, 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 and then for the tip, do what? Zero, zero, minus one in the Z. You could do one in the Z, but then, it, you know, if you had different flange sizes, you've got to make sure you're doing it right. Okay, so we got the vector. And then you, instead of clicking the screen, you can literally go one, two, hit OK. Two, three, hit OK. Like, watch this. One, two, enter. And then two, three, enter. Three, four, enter. Four, five, enter. Five, six, enter. Six, seven, enter. And then when you're done, again, hit escape. So again, keep in mind, we have not defined any geometry. There's nothing to reference this mesh. We just hard-coded it in. There should there, hold on. Right, uh, yep, and right here. And then zero, 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 minus one. And then now, now hit OK. Now you can do two and three, and then, and everything else is stored in. Okay, now. Watch this. Okay, so remember these tool, uh, toolbars up here where it says top, right, front, bottom, left, whatever? Hit isometric. So this is looking at the beam in three dimensions. Okay, so it's going along the x-axis. And what we should be able to determine are what the, is that beam oriented properly. Okay, so a couple things I want you to, or one thing I want you to do 
Okay. Um, remember before when we used that measuring toolbar up here, and we use this to determine, you know, distances and what have you. You see right next to it, see this little gray cube looking thing? Yeah. Did, do, where it says isometric, do you not have that? Okay, uh, let's see. Um, it's probably one of your toolbars missing, so we'll right click, maybe view orient. There we go. Okay, maybe. Or right there. There you go. That's just sort of viewing it in three dimensions. All right. Um, you all see that gray cube looking thing right there? Okay. What this is is sort of a, uh, a, a I guess, a, a rendering, uh, a rendering toolbar. And you can, like, if you're doing in three dimensions, you can wire thing or render things shaded or hidden, so you can kind of see through them. Like, if you've got a really geometrically complex model, like, let's say you're doing a uh, a model of a V6 engine and you want to look through the head to see the pistons or whatever, you can do that. Um, doesn't really matter for what we're doing because we just have a line. But if you notice, there's a couple other things like thickness uh, and cross-section. You all see that right there? If you're dealing with two-dimensional elements, it'll actually render the thickness. If you're dealing with one-dimensional elements, you see what happened? Use your mouse wheel and zoom in. See that? Now, is that beam oriented the way it should be? Good stuff. Nifty stuff, right? You can actually visibly see that the orientation is correct. Not too bad, right? Sound good? All right, any questions? All right, let me get back to isometric and then control A. Or actually, I tell you what, let me put it on top view. Let me turn that rendering off. So we can actually kind of see what's going on. So I know you probably can't see it on the TV, but on your screen you should see the little green dots where the nodes are. Does everybody see that? Everybody good? Okay. So what we have done now, and maybe now it's a good time to actually take a moment and take a step back and make sure that we're clear on the process, because our process has changed a little bit. Before, we said, all right, let's create the geometry and then mesh it. Now we just created the whole mesh ourselves, so we don't have to go through and do mesh control. This is the ultimate form of mesh control. We actually just did it ourselves. Okay. So now, all we got to do is constrain it, load it, and we're done, right? So let's go create some constraint sets and create some model set, or some load sets. Um, let's see, so model, load, create, manage set. We'll call it applied loads. Hit OK. We're done, and, let, and let's see, it says now it's got L1. So we're inside that load set, and then model constraint, create a constraint set. Call it boundary conditions. All right. Now, if you go back to your beam, you know, the image of the beam, you'll recall that this one here and this one here, those were the fixed ones, right? This is fixed. At x equals 0 and x equals 1152. Now, this one, uh, I believe, here, here, and here, those are pinned. kind of tough to see if this node is at 864, this value is at 400 and, or 288 or 1152, right? Maybe there's a tool inside FEMAP that will help us line things up a little more, or a little better. Maybe something like a work plane. 
If you go into that little rendering toolbar and then drop down, see where it says work plane? What it does is it kind of provides us a little coordinate system, if you will, to ensure that what we're looking at is correctly. Now, we're only looking at a model that is defined by a single line. So the only thing that we see is sort of an X, Y, Z, if you will, but we're only seeing values for that one dimension. But if you look, like a, that first node is supposed to be at, uh, after zero. It's supposed to be at what, like 192? See, look, about 192. Can I see it? Kind of nifty stuff, right? So it gives you an idea of ensuring that what you're looking at is correct, OK? All right, make sense? All right, so let's do our boundary conditions. And I'm going to keep it simple, all right? Um, let's go to model, uh, constraint. And before, we were doing them like on points, on curves, on surfaces. We're not doing that now because we don't have any points. We don't have any curves. We didn't create a geometry. We just created the mesh. So do we need nodal boundary conditions or elemental boundary conditions? Nodal. We need them on the nodes. So we'll go to nodal boundary condition, constraint. Now, if we do our fixed supports, which ones do we need? The one at the very beginning and the one at the very end. So let's just go here. And here, hit OK. And it's 1 and 7, which makes sense. It's the first one and the last one. And just say fixed. We'll call it a fixed support. And hit OK. And now look what it says. It says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, because it's restraining all three translations and all three rotations. All right? Now, now we'll do our pin supports, which we need one, what is it? We need one smack dab in the middle, one here, and then one about right there at 288. So that's this one right here, right? See, that ruler work plane comes in handy. So 288, that's that one. Uh, 576, that's that one, and that one. Okay, and then we'll say that one's pin. So notice how it only checks the... T, X, T, Y, T, Z. It doesn't check the rest. So we'll say that is a pin support. Hit OK. It's asking for another one, but tell it to shut up. Let me turn that work plane off so we can actually see what's going on here. OK. So what we got? We've got a, a structure that is fixed on the ends. And we've got intermediate row, or essentially pen supports. But since we're doing like essentially a shear moment beam diagram analysis, it really doesn't matter. So, yes. Oh, hit okay. It's because you didn't do that. It didn't. It, it was basically saying like you want to create a uh, constraint. Constraint what? So that's all, that's all it was doing. But you, yeah, so you had to check those in. So. All right. Um, sound good? Move that out of the way. All right, so our constraints are done. Now it's time to load the thing. Okay, and that loading—that's where I, um, you know, place that additional node here, and that additional node here. Now, before we load, I actually want to put this in isometric, uh, and you'll see why here in a second. Okay, let's look at our distributed loads. We have one on this first portion, which was what, like two kips per foot? My, did I, is that two kips? All right. Okay, um, so let's go to model, let's go to load, and if we're starting with the distributed load, do we need nodal or elemental? Elemental, because we're putting it on the element. So an elemental load, we're going to pick that first element, all right? And then we're really, we're dealing with a distributed load, so let's do a distributed load. Now I'm going to give this one a title, I'm going to call it a uniformly distributed load. Okay, uniformly distributed load. Now, it's going down, right? So our value is negative. Do we put in 2 or do we put in 2 over 12? Because it's in kips per foot, we need kips per inch. One of the things I, I want you to recognize, you can actually literally just type minus 2 over 12. Now that's now, one thing to be clear about, this is at end A of the element. At the other end, you need to do the same thing. 
And you'll see why, how the next loads we do, why that matters. So negative 2 over 12, negative 2 over 12. So it's constant throughout. So we hit OK. Now, look at this. This little box pops up. Now, direction, element X, element Y, element Z. Global X, global Y, global Z. So you can just specify distributed loads based on that individual element direction, you know, the beam orientation, or along the whole coordinate system. Let's just keep it simple and do it along the coordinate system. What direction does that load need to be acting about? Well, we already put the minus in. We've already taken that into account. But what axis, X, Y, or Z? Y, it's going down. So let's just do global Y. Hit OK. Is that looking right? Looks right, doesn't it? Exactly the way it should. Now, let's do the next two distributed loads. Now, here, let me go back to the image so that everybody's clear on what's up. Here, for those last two, we have a triangular load. It goes from zero up and then up down, all right, B back down to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here, and let's just look at this element right here, just that one. All right, there should be element number five. We hit OK. It's a distributed load, and I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it, like, first triangular load. Frisk first. Okay, now if we go from end A to end B, it starts at zero and it goes up to minus three, right? But minus three divided by 12. There we go. So, oh, there's my mouse. All right. So minus three divided by 12. And then, same thing, global Y. We hit global Y, we hit OK, and then look what happens. Now it's increasing the way it should. So the next one, you tell me, we click this element. We'll call it second triangular load. Now it's backwards, right? Before it was like 0 to minus 3, now it's minus 3 back to 0. So we have minus 3 over 12 on the end A, and then 0 on the end B. Hit OK. Global Y. And then hit Escape. Because it's, it's like, give me more, give me more. There, there are no more distributed loads, or elemental loads, I guess I should say. Not too bad, right? Simple stuff, right? OK, so again, what we've done is we've, uh, we've done those elemental loads. We took into, ca uh, into care our consistent units, and we've dealt with our distributions. Now, we're going to do the load distributions a lot differently next time because we've got, what, six elements in this problem? We're going to have, like, 100 elements in the next problem. So how we do this, we're going to have to take very special care to ensure that we do that right, okay? Now... The next one we have is our joint loads, right, or our nodal loads. Now, if you remember, we've got a 40 kip load going down here and here, but there's also here, there's a concentrated moment. We've got to handle that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to model, I'm going to get a load, but we did our elemental loads, now I'm going to do our nodal load. Okay, so let's do a nodal load. Now, the 40 kips is the same here and here. So I'm going to place one at node 2 and at node 4. Okay, so this one and this one. Those are the ones that have the 40 kip load. Hit OK. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So we'll say 40 kip vertical load. And it's going to be in the Y direction. So minus 40. Hit OK. Look what happened. Minus 40, minus 40. Make sense? All right. Now, we have a concentrated moment right here. Okay? All right. 
Let me bring back up the image. What direction is it acting? It's acting like this, right? Let's bring it back. Remember that right hand rule? All right, you take your fingers, your fingers follow the moment, your thumb points in the direction of the couple, right? So it's going like that, right? Let's keep that in mind. So we go to FE map and we say, all right, we're placing a couple right here, right? Just on number four. Now we're going to say 75 foot kip con or couple. All right. Now, we don't apply a concentrated force. We have to apply a concentrated moment. So we go to moment. Notice how these change to MX, MY, MZ. So you tell me which one are we going to put in, X, Y, or Z? Z and minus, because positive, it'd have to go this way. It'd have to go that way. So we go like that, and we say minus 75. Is it minus 75? Times 12. There you go. And you can literally just say 75 times 12, like what you would do in Excel. All right? And hit OK. Now look what happened. Now you've got that 900 inch kip couple concentrated and it's going the right way. Hit escape, tell it you're done. Not too bad, right? All right. <laughs> Any questions? So we skipped geometry creation this time and actually just created the nodes and the elements directly which for a simple model depending on what you're doing that might actually make the most sense it might make sense if you're trying to do mesh generation and look at different mesh densities if you're writing like a MATLAB program to do a mesh analysis generate it okay all right so we're ready to analyze we got a model analysis We'll create a new analysis using NX Nashtran. We'll just call it Run the Model. Hit OK. And then let's analyze this. And there we go. OK. Everybody good? I'm going to close this little analysis monitor. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right. So the model, the model has run. Let's see if we can clean up the, the results a little bit or plot some things. In order to do that, I'm actually going to, um, I think I'm going to turn some things off. Let's turn off the display of the loads and the boundary conditions. So I'm going to right click, go to visibility. Let's turn off the loads and the constraints so that all I'm looking at is the model. Okay. Now, let's right click. Let's go to post data. Let's see if we can, oh, whoop, I hit the wrong thing. Right click, post data. Let's see if there's a couple things we can look at. All right. Um, Let's see, what do we have here? We've got a bunch of, uh, you know, bunch more different things than we had with the rod because all we had was axial forces and torques. Now we've got shears and moments and all of that. Maybe we look at a moment diagram, you know? So maybe I'll look at the moments on one end of the beam. Maybe we'll just do that. We'll hit OK. Maybe turn on a contour plot by looking at that select a contour view. And by golly gosh gee, there's some values. Well, that's interesting. There's nothing there. Huh, that's interesting. Tell you what, let's actually, let's take a moment. Let, let, ha, ah, take a moment. Let's take a moment and just look at the displaced shape. Hmm. Does that look right? I mean, use that engineering noggin that I know you all have. 
Do beam deflections look like that? I mean, have you ever seen a beam deflect like that? Of course not. Beams don't look like that. It's not what they do. Okay? This deflected shape is inaccurate. All right? You're the analyst. What does that mean? You tell me. This deflected shape is inaccurate, so what would you, as the finite element analyst, do to get a more accurate answer? Remember, finite element analysis is an approximation. So what would we do to improve our results? What would we do to improve our results? You tell me. I mean, let's, let's agree, does this look right? Does this look correct? I mean, a beam deflection should be smooth. It should be, you know, continuous. Beams don't just go boop. They don't do that. So what, all right, ignore FE mapping. You know, I'm not asking you about what button do you press and what menu. I'm asking finite elements. What do you do to improve a, a finite element analysis? Finer mesh, use more elements, you know. Remember, you are approximating an answer over this element. If it doesn't look right, maybe you should use more approximations, right? Remember, think about going back to like calculus. Remember, you're calculating the integral under, a, or the, uh, the area under a curve, and that's where integrals come into play. Remember, what do you do? You cut that area into a, you know, a bunch of slices. The more slices, the better answer, but the more number crunching you're doing. This is not an acceptable deflected shape, is it? That's not what beams look like. So next time, we're going to say, man, we screwed up. We can do better than that. We're going to overkill it a little bit, but you know, that's the whole point. You know, this is wrong, so we're going to use a boatload of elements next time to get it right, okay? And then we'll look at next time at how we can interpret some things like maybe some shear diagrams, maybe some moment diagrams, maybe some contour plots and things like that and see what we can get. Sound good? All right, so that's one point I really wanted to make with today's lecture is that it's on you to, as the analyst, to interpret. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. So. Next time we'll do better. That's all I got for you guys. And everybody turn in their exam? All right. That's all I got. You all have a good weekend. I will see you all on Tuesday.